Earlier today, I spoke with the Commissioner of Public Health for the state of Massachusetts, and we touched briefly on the opioid epidemic. We're going to continue that conversation. And just to give us a little bit of context here, we've got a couple of slides to take a look at. As you can see from this, the rate of death from opioids has increased dramatically. And you kind of look at the timeline. I think there's a little typo on the left-hand side, but take a look at 95. 2000 and 2015. We'll talk about that timeline in a bit. From stat, by 2017, 2020, excuse me, the annual U.S. death toll from opioids will likely surpass the worst year of gun deaths on record. And finally, by 2027, the annual U.S. death toll from opioids will likely surpass the worst year of gun deaths. This could approach the worst year of AIDS deaths during the peak of the epidemic in the 1990s. So. With that in mind, given all that information, I wanted to ask you sort of a personal, professional question first, Dr. Walji. When did you first realize that this was an issue? I think it was going back to just seeing patients over the last few years and recognizing that more and more of、um, our trauma patients and now our elective surgery patients are coming in either from the sequelae of opioid addiction、um, or opioid dependence、um, and are presenting to surgery more commonly already taking these medications.、Um, and I think reflecting on that, I realized that surgeons have a great opportunity to really a, play a role to prevent the opioid epidemic. We'll talk a little bit about both of your specialties in terms of the studies that you've done, Dr. Barth. When did you first realize? When did the epiphany happen for you that this was huge, the enormity of it? It's also because behind these increased deaths is our curves that show that the number of opioids that are being prescribed is going up. It's been quadrupled since 2000. I think there's a clear association there, and it's、mm -hmm. really just seeing it in the media, frankly, and、uh, realizing as a surgeon I prescribe a lot of opioids, and I just wanted to see what can I do to make a difference. Well, let's talk about the study that you published. Can you outline your findings? And also tell us. I guess we should back up. Tell us what was the question that you wanted to answer? Sure. So,、um, so I'm a surgical oncologist. I looked at、um, some several common outpatient general surgery procedures, five procedures, a couple breast surgeries, inguinal hernia repair, gallbladder removal, very common surgeries. And we just looked to see how many opioids are prescribed to patients after having those surgeries、um, in a year at Dartmouth Hitchcock, is where I work. And <clears throat> we saw that there was a, a lot of variability. Some people had five or ten prescribed; others had as many as a hundred prescribed for the same exact operation.、Um, but then the, I think we went beyond that, though, and then really asked patients how many they used, which is really critical. So, and we found that they really only used about a quarter of what they were prescribed. Um, so we were able to come up with guidelines then, as to how many opioids really should be prescribed, say for or a reasonable amount to be prescribed for these different operations. And、um, I think that's helpful because really there were no guidelines out there for any of these really common common operations. It's hard to believe, but there really weren't. Can you understand why doctors were prescribing or giving out these prescriptions for these large amounts? So, as surgeons, to, when we're helping people, an unfortunate byproduct is that it hurts sometimes after doing our operations, and so、um, we want to make sure we take care of patients' pain,、um, and that's so that's uh, a, a uh, really important thing for us.、Um, and then it was also hard、um, in the past for for us to call in prescriptions for、um, for additional opioids if patients needed them. Um, recently, that's,、um, that hurdle has been overcome because now we can e-prescribe、um, uh, prescriptions for patients.、Um, but I think it's, it's mainly just we wanted to make sure that we took care of patients' pain. And I think people,、uh, doctors, weren't looking as much at the societal imperative to really try to minimize the amount of the opioids that were prescribed. And what did you just? I'm excuse me.、Yeah. What did you discover that patients were doing with the leftover opioids? Right. So. There are FDA-approved ways to、um, take care of unused opioids、um, and to usually bring them back to, in, to a lockbox at a police station, for example. Or there are other ways to dispose of them.、Um, and only about nine percent of our patients in our study actually dispose of them in an FDA-approved manner. So that's certainly an opportunity that everyone has: is to try to,、um, if you do have these extra pills, to dispose of them in a better way so that they don't. Fall into other patient people's hands because it's the diversion is the big problem. They get diverted to other people who then start using them,、um, and then move on to、um, uh, 
like heroin and, and fentanyl and, and use. So. Dr. Welge, I want to bring you into this conversation. Your research at Michigan Open has been focused a bit on I want to say this right, prior medical histories as a predictor of a patient's post-operative use of opioids. Mm -hmm. Can you fill in the blanks there? Yeah, I think to dovetail on what Dr. Barth was saying, um, we're seeing a growing number of individuals who um, are increasingly using opioids or even dependent on opioids that are presenting to us for surgery. And when we go back and look to see what does their post-operative course look like, um, unfortunately, they tend to struggle more than patients who aren't taking opioids. We know that they will stay in the hospital longer. They're less likely to go home. Um, they may struggle with pain and other um, you know, management with physical therapy and occupational therapy and getting up and moving around after an operation and ultimately they end up requiring more resources. So I think that, you know, understanding who these patients are, recognizing um, them when they come in to present to us to talk about a surgical problem is absolutely critical. Did you discover why it became so difficult for them after? No, I think the mechanisms are unclear. We know that opioids can be very helpful to manage acute pain, um, but they're also associated with dependence, hyperalgesia. Um, they can cause respiratory depression and ileus and all kinds of other effects that can really hinder the postoperative recovery. In doing your research, what do the patients tell you about this experience? I mean, we've talked a little bit about the doctors, but the patients, do they expect to get opioids at this point? I think that's a critical part in mm -hmm. trying to understand solutions, is to making sure that our patients um, understand what their recovery is going to be like. They may not necessarily expect to be able to drive a car two hours after an operation or go back to work two hours after mm -hmm. an operation. Mm -hmm. So I think the burden is on us as physicians to counsel them about what to expect when opioids may be appropriate and when there's other alternatives that may be just as effective or if not more. Did you find that doctors themselves had enough information about opioids? Well, I think that's an interesting question also. Um, certainly when I've trained and when many of us have trained um, in the 1990s and the 2000s, the understanding where opioids fit and postoperative pain management just really wasn't part of the rubric of surgical education. I think the tides are turning on that, and mm -hmm. so I think it's a great opportunity for us to really rethink our prescribing practices. Right. Dr. Barth, when you were training. Yeah, yeah and I think um, education's key here because uh, once we did that initial study and just sort of came up with some guidelines in terms of how many opioids would be appropriate for patients, we just communicated that information to the other surgeons in our group, so like 25 surgeons in our group and residents, and it was just educating doctors. Are very, doctors are very evidence-driven. They just needed the, the evidence and the, and the um, uh, sort of the information about how many opioids patients use. And then it, that, we showed that dramatically changed the prescription. So for those five operations, we then looked and saw how many people prescribed just after hearing information about this. And um, overall, it dropped by 53%, the number of prescriptions that were written for these patients. All five of the operations had dramatic decreases in the number of opioids that were prescribed. And then you might say, well, oh, well, the patient's in pain, you know, because you didn't give them enough um, uh, um, opioids. And that definitely was not the case, because only one of 250 patients that were in our second study ended up needing a refill. So we, st we were able to cut the number of opioids prescribed by more than half and still take care of everyone's pain. Why do patients go for the refill if they don't need it? Well, very few did. So in our study, only one, um, I mean, ended up coming back for a refill out of 250. So um, they really, they didn't need um, to get refills. I, they're, yeah, they're I pain. Said, historically, why do oh, patients yeah. go back for the refill? Um, well, I guess another question is, well, why were some people you know, maybe using more than the average person? And people end up using them sometimes just because they're given a prescription. They feel like they have to use all of them. Or sometimes patients use them to, go to help them go to sleep at night. We kind of ask detailed questions of patients about why did they use some of those, those pain meds. But like Dr. Waldie was saying, I think setting ex patients' expectations that um, you know, you're going to have some pain. We're not trying to get pain to zero. Meds, but... Meds, but like Dr. Waldie was saying, I think setting ex patients' expectations that um, you know, you're going to have some pain, we're not trying to get pain to zero, that opioids really aren't our best um, medicine, really, for taking care of acute pain. In fact, that other medicines like acetaminophen and ibuprofen are really much more effective relievers of acute pain. And I've tell, we tell all our patients to use those first and really only go for the opioids if you really need them, if your pain's not relieved by those. And um, in that second study, we found that you know, over 80% of our patients ended up taking either acetaminophen or, um, or ibuprofen. And really, the combination is the best, frankly. But, um, and then a lot higher proportion were not 
didn't need any opioids um, uh, for their surgeries. I shared with Dr. Barth, my sister was the third class of women at Dartmouth, and she is a dentist, has been practicing for 30 years, and I've talked to her about this, and I want to read you part of this text. Again, this is between sisters, this is not. <laughs> opioids, I don't know. You know, back in the day when these synthetics came out, everyone was all about pain control, no one could feel a thing, and patients came to expect that and demanded it, sort of like the antibiotic issue when they want it when it's not appropriate, so it got out of control. I'd almost stopped prescribing them because most of the time I could reasonably control things with NSAIDs and acetaminophen, and I did not deal with long-term pain, but mine is a very narrow experience, so take it for what it's worth. Yeah. There's a lot that's interesting in that, I think, not just because I love my sister and she's smart. Um, <laughs> the patient expectation, mm -hmm. the idea that uh, opioids, prescribed opioids, have become so, it's casual in a way. How do we educate people? And what has been your experience with people? Do they just expect it and they don't want to feel pain? Well, I think, um, you know, for a long time, there was this thought that opioids couldn't be addictive if they were given in the context of chronic pain and if people were taking them for pain. Um, I think we understand now better that that evidence um, was not necessarily, you know, kind of what we thought that it was. Um, and I think that we have um, also strong evidence to show that about 5 to 10 percent of people who undergo surgery who weren't taking opioids prior to surgery end up continuing to need refills after an operation. So I think having this, you know, having more evidence like Dr. Barth's work showing, you know, this is what an average patient would take after an operation. This is the risk for dependence after an operation. And these are the consequences of leaving, leaving these medications in your home is absolutely essential to equip and empower our patients to recover. Yeah. Most of them, I, a lot of the operations I do now, the patients, they don't want the opioids. I, I started having a discussion with them about, you know, their post-operative pain control, and I'll say, well, I want you to use the acetaminophen and ibuprofen first and stuff, and then I, I said, we can give you a prescription for opioids. They said, no, I don't, I don't even want any of the opioids, you know, so because patients, patients are learning about it, and, and I, I really think this is an opportunity for, um, you know, patients can take this into their own hands, too, because, you know, if a patient gets a prescription, you know, I was talking with Allison earlier, my, my son had his appendix taken out, he was over in New York, and, uh, and he's 22, and he had his, his appendix taken out, and they gave him a prescription of, uh, for 50 oxycodone after a laparoscopic appendectomy. My wife, who's a nurse, just basically handed the prescription back to the physician and said, no, you know, he lives with five other 22-year-olds, and he really doesn't need to have 50 oxycodone in the house, you know? And so patients can take this into their own hands, um, uh, and, uh, you know, one thing they can do is they can just, you know, limit the amount that they take themselves, even if their physician doesn't know about this so much, and they can dispose of it accurate, um, adequately uh, the ways, you know, guidelines um, say. So there's a lot that patients can do. One of the things that we talked about a little bit backstage, and as someone who's been covering this a little bit, is when we start talking about the why of this, you know you have to get to the root of the why, but there seems to be a lot of blame going around. It's the drug company's fault. It's the doctor's fault. It's the patient's fault. It's the media's fault. I'm not really sure that's particularly helpful, but as we go back to figuring out how this started, out of those four things I listed, um, I'm going to ask you to present it in a more positive way. What responsibility do the doctors have? What responsibility do the drug companies have, Dr. Walji? So I think we're in a great opportunity because we are getting incredible evidence about what patients take, what they need, um, and kind of what their experiences are after surgery. As Dr. Barth pointed out, many of them are satisfied after surgery. They're happy with their recovery, even without opioids or with, you know, out getting a prescription for 90 because they can do just as well with 5 to 10. So I think as we gather evidence, um, we will be stronger in trying to make recommendations um, and help us move forward from this crisis. What do you think about yeah, doctors there's, and drug there's companies? Our approaches now are they're multimodal approaches. So you know, we'll give patients medicines before their surgery. So they get acetaminophen before the surgery. They get medicines like Neurontin before their surgery. Intraoperatively, we're doing things a lot with local anesthetics to try to minimize the amount of pain people are having. So um, we're giving them intravenous uh, ibuprofen equivalent. You know, so there are a lot of things we're doing 
around in, in the, at the time of surgery to really minimize. So when patients wake up, they have minimal discomfort and, and you know, can go, uh, go forward. But there's, there's still a lot we have to learn. There's, um, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, patients, let's say trauma, there's a lot of other patient populations out there. And, you know, how many, how many, um, uh, how much opioids do they need? So my orthopedic colleagues at Dartmouth have done a study on the orthopedic surgery patients. I've got some colorectal surgeons looking at, you know, what's going on with, with uh, their group, our trauma patients, you know, so there are a lot of different patient groups. It's also inpatients, you know, so if we're, we've operated on someone, they've been in the hospital for four or five days and they're going home, well, how many opioids, you know, do you give them, if any? Um, well, we don't know. So um, actually right now, you know, so we've been working on some studies that, you know, can help give guidelines for how many patients, how many opioids to send people home with. You know, there are laws in Massachusetts that you're supposed to send them home with a week's supply, but it's hard to know how much a week's supply is. Is it, you know, are they taking, you know, say, eight a day for a week, or is it two a day, you know? So there's ambiguity there, and hopefully, you know, as we do more research on this, we'll uh, better inform physicians to, um, to prescribe more, more appropriately. I'm going to ask one more question and then open up the floor to questions, because I'm sure you have a lot to ask. Uh, if you could, either of you, have an enormous amount of money string-free, no strings attached, where would you appropriate it to help this epidemic? Where do you think it needs to go? I think it needs to go to develop tools and pathways to help empower patients to get through the post-operative period, um, either with opioid alternatives or with the minimal amount they need. What are opioid alternatives, for example? Things like um, acetaminophen, um, you know, NSAIDs when possible. And there's also other non-pharmacologic strategies, such as mindfulness-based stress reduction, which has been um, shown to be quite effective for chronic pain conditions like low back pain um, that I think could very easily be explored in the acute pain setting. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Waldy's answer is a perfect one there, so I don't have anything else particularly. Okay. Well, let's open it up to the floor. And we've got some mics out. Who's got the mic? Hi, um, my name's Jordan. I'm a... Uh, Where are you, here. Jordan? Over here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, you stand up, please. So I am in a wheelchair. Oh, I'm sorry. Awesome. That's okay. Um, I'm a patient and a blogger, and... I wanted to ask how you would respond to patients who use opioids for chronic pain disorders and are now having trouble obtaining their medication. Um, personally, that's been a problem for me, and I know many of my other friends. Um, my doctors personally approve of it, but they all say they don't prescribe them. It's their policy. So what would you say to that? I've heard that story from yeah, well, you as well. What we've mainly been focusing on our discussion right now is acute pain. It's not chronic pain, you know. So it's a, you're a whole different story. I think it was an interesting article in the England Journal a couple of weeks ago. Was the other victims of the opioid epidemic or people who have who need the opioids for long-term uh, usage? And I think I, I, I think uh, your, your doc, you know you and your doctors are going to have access to that and 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 need appropriate medication. You know what, what we've really been focusing on is um, the acute pain episodes and trying to just you know, minimize the amount of opioids that are available there for diversion um, and, uh, and misuse. I think that's the problem, though. I, I think that's part of the problem, is that um, so much of the discussion is about acute pain, and chronic pain isn't coming in, so, so it's kind of being sidelined. Um, I... That's an important point. Thank you for making it. Appreciate it. Yeah, Hi, this is John. I'm John Rodas. I'm a national disability advocate. I'm actually going to springboard off of what Jordan said. The CDC set up guidelines. They were mm -hmm. guidelines. They weren't mandates. Mm -hmm. And this basically sprung out of uh, hysteria. Not, not meaning that you know I've lost I've lost friends to heroin overdose, but the majority of cases have been heroin. It hasn't been hydrocodone. It has been fentanyl and heroin. So what I guess what I'm, I'm making is more of a statement than a question. I understand where acute pain has. The things that you've discussed are important. Doctors have to be more uh, responsible for what they prescribe. Those that are chronic pain patients, they have doctors that are right now being threatened by their own states because they're prescribing to chronic pain patients that have been their patients for over 10 years. So this is the, ba the baby being thrown out with the bathwater. So we really need the medical community to stand up and defend the chronic pain population. Do you have another question here? Yeah, I, I guess I want to add to the chorus here. Oh, I can stand up. So, so the problem with uh, um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that only, I know, never give up the mic. That was Phil Donahue's thing. You never yeah. give up the mic. 
uh, those of you who are old enough to remember Phil Donahue, um, the, uh, that only a small percent, and I'm not sure, I'm going to say three or four, it could be off, of, of people who do use um, opioids end up becoming addicted. That it, is, that it is a small percent. It's sort of like everybody drinks a small percent of people become alcoholics. Uh, we do have an issue, the gentleman's correct in terms of fentanyl and heroin and so on and deaths. The problem with, with having government come in is that we don't regulate very well. You know, we, we, it's, it's unfortunate. We, we always we go to one end or we go to the other end. And, and I think that this issue of chronic pain, I'm going to even say short-term chronic pain, which can be anywhere from, you know, up to a year because you might be having uh, orthopedic surgery, such as myself with a new shoulder, which is better than the old shoulder, or my partner who had hip surgery. So the thing is that there are some people who cannot take NSAIDs. There are people who you, your stomach cannot uh, sustain, uh, you know, uh, over and over again doses of uh, ibuprofen or Motrin. And so there, there's just got to be a balance here. I mean, I have expressed this to the Baker administration personally early on when they were considering their policies here. But I think that there's not a, I think people are afraid to sort of speak out in this way to say we have to have a balance and that we may have... The, the woman who just spoke about how she can't get Medicaid, that's because her doctor's afraid. So what you do is you come up with one policy and the answer is no, and then you've got other folks who are suffering. Well, backstage, you expressed a concern about too much course correction and that we should be careful about not letting the pendulum swing the other way. Yeah, I think it's absolutely important to keep patients at the center of the conversation, both in the context of acute pain prescribing and chronic pain prescribing. And I agree with you 100% that the policies that work for prescribing in one setting, perhaps in the emergency room, may not work at all in the setting of prescribing for chronic pain or after surgery. And so I think there's a lot more work that we need to do to kind of understand what are the pressure points that are there, what helps patients after surgery. Obviously, none of us want people to be uncomfortable or in pain after they undergo procedures. Procedures. Uh, but I think kind of understanding why in the United States and Canada are we so different than the rest of the world um, and how can we design policies that allow us to prescribe smarter will be critical. Yeah, a couple of comments. Here. One is just by, in the studies that we've done, just by educating physicians in terms of an appropriate amount, they were able to markedly decrease the amount that they prescribe. So we didn't need outside regulations to enable us to do that. So it was just by providing doctors with data and enable them to make you know, very decisions with patients, um, patient-centered decisions. So um, the ibuprofen problem isn't really a problem if you're only giving it for a very short period of time. Um, so that, that's rarely a problem there. And I think we do need to keep in mind that um, the vast majority of, of um, people who end up using um, uh, heroin or fentanyl end up using the prescribed opioids first. And they, they don't just start with heroin, they start with these and then end up moving on to those which do kill them. And that's, that's an important thing that we have to keep in mind. Um, mine is a short question. Could you give um, proper means of adequate disposal? other than taking it to a police station, because some people can't get to a police station. Can they flush it down the toilet? Right, okay, so um, yeah, that's an excellent question, and people should be more informed about that. So um, there are a couple of ways that are approved by the FDA, okay? So one is to um, mix the opioids, okay, was to um, put them in a plastic bag and put water in there and mix them with kitty litter or dirt, and then dispose them in your regular garbage unlabeled, okay? So that's one way that's approved. Um, the flushing them down the toilet is, um, some, some places uh, espouse that and others don't as much. Um, and certainly bringing them to the, police to the police station where they have drop boxes is the universal um, best way to dispose of them. She asked taking it back to the doctor for people. Right. Um, so uh, we'll just have to bring them to our pharmacy. We, we, um, it's actually uh, highly regulated um, what you can do with those. Um, so we'd have, we'd have to then dispose of them into a drop box or somewhere like that. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up to what this woman said was some people aren't comfortable going to a police station. This is a little outside of your view, but what role do you think decriminalization would have? if people could just bring their drugs back or if someone could just walk in and say, I have an opioid abuse issue. Well, I think, um, you know, to touch on your point, um, you know, it's not, 
you know, even if decriminalization wasn't necessarily an issue, you know, after surgery, patients are often in pain. They can't drive. They're relying on family members to get back. Um, and in our state, when we've looked, many patients live um, fairly far from a disposal site, even if it is a police um, place. And at our institution, we're, we're not allowed to take back medications. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be critical to find novel ways to dispose of those um, medications and really make it accessible for patients to get there in the post-operative period. Any more questions? We've got about one minute left. Oh, quickly, okay. Uh, Glenn Fennelly, I'm a pediatrician from Rutgers. Uh, very briefly, what you've described is a superb quality improvement project in terms of producing uh, the use of opiates in your hospital. How far are we away from making this a national metric or a quality metric in all hospitals like catheter, central line associated bacterial infection? Before we do that, I don't think the culture is going to change, and I think it's the best way to get there. This is huge, yeah. Um, Dr. Walsh is an expert on this. I don't, I don't think are. I'm an expert on this. But I do think that um, you raise a good point. There's a lot of barriers, and I think part of it will be educating um, providers, part of it will be educating surgeons, and really reassuring people um, from you know, both groups that we can effectively take care of patients in the post-operative period while prescribing less and creating tools that will allow patients to have a smooth recovery. Dr. Barr, Dr. Well. Yeah, there's, there's no reason why things that work at Dartmouth-Hitchcock can't work across the country. Um, it's, it, there's absolutely no reason, and, and I think this can be applied to the common general surgical operations that are done all across the country tomorrow. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you so much. Great.